and uh, we walked in the doctor's office and the doctor said, well, what can I do for you, Mr. Biden? He said, well, I got this problem. He said, I've been forgetting things. And the doctor said, well, sit down here. And, and he sat down and he said, now open your mouth, stick out your tongue and say ah. So he went, ah. And the doctor said, Mr. Biden, what's that postage stamp, stamp doing on your tongue? He said, that's it. I wondered what happened to that thing. <laughs> and so, you know, people, a lot of people are going to be voting for him to be president. And he don't even know what day he's in. And if he gets in there, this country's going to be a mess. So we really need to be in prayer about this coming election. So anyway, all right, let's say I need some readers. And I'm going to ask Sister Shirley to read for us 1 Samuel chapter 26 and verse 12. Okay, tell me again. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, that's in the Old Testament. Oh, okay. <laughs> chapter 26, 26 and verse 12. Okay, got it. Brother Phil. Look up for us, Psalms 121, 2 through 4. Psalms 121, 121, verses 2 through 4. Brother Russ, can you hear me? Okay, look up for us, Jonah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. All right, uh, Sister Giles, look up for us. First Peter, chapter one, verse seven. Brother Giles, look up for us. Psalms eighty-nine and verse nine. Psalms eighty-nine, verse nine. Brother Dunn, would you look up for us? Isaiah fifty-seven, verses twenty and twenty-one. That's Isaiah fifty-seven, twenty and twenty-one. Sister Dunn, would you look up for us Matthew 7, 25. That's Matthew 7, 25. Sister Monica, would you look up for us Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Psalms 46, 1 through 3. I think that's all the readers I need right now. So, anyway... Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you've provided for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to this old sinful world, willingly suffered, bled, and died on that old cruel cross to redeem us from hell. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us from day to day. We thank you, Lord, this day for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your preserved word in the old King James Bible. We thank you, Lord, for your church that you bled and died for. You purchased the church with your own blood, the scripture says. And Father, we thank you for these blessings. We pray you bless this Sunday school hour. God, give me the words to speak. And I pray it be a blessing to the, those who listen. We pray for our service this morning. For Brother Norwood as he preaches and also this evening, God bless and bless our fellowship together. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now in the last lesson on miracles, we considered Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 18. And in those verses, we saw the miracle of the, whose son? The king's son? The governor's son? Whose son was it? A widow's son son. And what was wrong with this young man? Did he have the palsy or the leprosy or was he blind or deaf? What, what was wrong with him? He was dead as a hammer. He was dead. And what did Jesus do for him? Jesus gave him life. Now you know that's something that the devil cannot do. The devil cannot Come up to a dead person and bring that person back to life again. The devil does not have that kind of power. He has the power to heal, but he does not have the power to resurrect a dead person to life again. 
I want you to look with me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 12. Now, this has to do with the Antichrist. It says, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, if I understand prophecy, I think I do, I believe prophecy tells us that the Antichrist is going to be uh, wounded with a deadly wound in the middle of the tribulation period, and people are going to think he's dead. But the devil's going to heal his deadly wound and bring about a counterfeit resurrection. People are going to believe this is truly Christ who's resurrected from the dead. Now, as I said, the devil has the power to heal, but he does not have the power to give life to a dead body. Now, we come to a miracle which proves that Jesus Christ is the creator. Kulin Chutin, that's what the Indians call the creator out on the reservation. Kulin Chutin means Jesus Christ is the creator. C.C. Creek, Kulin Chutin, Jesus Christ is the creator. And, uh, you know, I've used that on those Indians out there, and they talk about Kool and Chutin. I say, you know who Kool and Chutin is? Uh, well, he's the creator. I said, who's the creator? Well, Kool and Chutin. I said, who's Kool and Chutin? Well, I don't know. I said, Jesus Christ is Kool and Chutin. He is the creator. He's the one that created everything. And so anyway, here we see proof of this in this next miracle, the miracle of the stilling of the storm. And I'm going to read Luke 8, verse, beginning verse 22 through 25. It says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. And then he arose and rebuked the, rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Now, as we consider, as we consider these verses and the accounts of Matthew and Mark, it's evident that Jesus Christ had a human body. Now, in theological terminology, this is called the hypostatic union. It means Christ is just as much God, he's just as much God as he is man, just as much man as he is God. He is perfect human flesh indwelt by the second person of the Holy Trinity. Now, you know, when a person, an ordinary person is born, he's born with a body, with a soul, and with a spirit. But the spirit is dead until that person repents of his sins and receives Christ as his Savior. Then his spirit comes alive. But when Christ was born, he had a perfect body, he had a perfect soul, and he had a perfect spirit because the spirit was the Holy Spirit of God. And so now this is the very one who at times past had caused sleep to fall upon others. And we see this throughout the Old Testament. You know, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, instead thereof. And he took that rib, and he made Eve a beautiful woman, our first mother was Eve, and you know, uh, there's a comedy writer that said, you know, when, when God created Eve, the, the, the serpent nudged Adam, and he said, there goes the neighborhood, well, you know, comedy writers and so forth, you know, they don't, they don't understand the Bible anyway, but there was a preacher once said, being a good husband and a good preacher is similar it's best if you like your boss, you know? 
And uh, if if you like your boss, you're you're good. You're in good shape. But anyway, let's let's read First Samuel twenty six verse twelve. Sister Shirley, would you read that for us, please? So David took the spear and the cruise of water upon Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and no man saw it nor knew it. Neither awaked, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. A deep sleep had fallen upon them. You see, King Saul, he was after David. He wanted to kill him. So he and his soldiers, his commanding officer, his commanding general was a man named Abner. And so they came into the wilderness of Ziph, searching for David. Now David, his commanding officer, his commanding general was a man named Abishai. And so during the night, God caused Saul and his soldiers to fall into a deep sleep. And David and his soldiers crept into their camp. And Abishai wanted to take Saul's spear and thrust him through and kill him. He said, I won't strike him a second time. And he said, I'm going to kill him. David said, don't do it. We must not touch the anointed of the Lord. He said, take his spear and his cruise of water from his bolster. And let's be gone. And so that's what they did. And went over on a far hill. And when they awoke, David called out and he said, Abner, you're worthy of death. You've not, you've not guarded the king. And King Saul said, is that you, my son, David? And David said, yes. He said, why do you chase me through the wilderness? Why are you after me? And, and King Saul said, uh, well, he said, you're more righteous than I am. He said, he said, I'm not going to chase you again, David. But he lied and he tried over and over again to kill David, but it didn't work. But my point is this. God brought a deep sleep upon Saul and his soldiers. Now, God's able to do that. Now, let's look at the book of Daniel. Book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 9. Daniel 10, verse 9, it says, Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. Now, Daniel had been praying for 21 days. And it's evident to me, just reading the scripture, that he did not sleep during those 21 days. But when at the end of the 21 days, he fell into a deep sleep. And this angel came and he touched him and he set him on his knees and on his hands. And this angel said to him, he said, from the very first day you began to pray, Daniel, your prayer was heard. Now, I've come to answer your prayer. But he said, the, the prince of the king of Persia withstood me 21 days. This was an evil uh, spirit. A fallen angel that withstood him. But he said, I called upon Michael, the archangel, which was in more, more in power than this evil angel was. And he said, he came to my rescue and he opened the way for me to come to the answer, to bring answer to your prayer. And here Daniel was in a deep sleep. And I believe it was because he had not slept during them 21 days. Now that would be unheard of today. That in itself is a miracle. But you know, God has power to make one go to sleep. He has power to make one stay awake. Now, because of his tired body, Jesus slept. He could become weary. He could become tired. He could become hungry. He could become thirsty. And you know, Jesus, when he was in the wilderness temptation, the Bible says he was in hunger. He was hungry. He'd fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil came to him and he said, you see all these stones? He said, why don't you command these stones to turn into bread so you can feed yourself? But Jesus said, Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, you know, Jesus was hungry at that point. And then the Bible says the devil left him and the angels came and ministered to him. I believe they brought food to him, brought water to him, and uh, they ministered to him. That's what that means. And then we find that on the cross, Jesus was dehydrated. Remember as he hung there on the cross? 
He said, I thirst. Nobody brought him any water. They brought a sponge soaked with vinegar and hyssop and put it to his lips. And when he received it, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And he died in our place. And so, you know, he, had, he, he could become weary. He could become hungry. And he could become thirsty. And so, you know, there is a striking contrast between the prophet Jesus, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and his ship with the prophet Jonah and his ship. The sleep of Jesus was undisturbed because it was a sleep of pure and holy conscience. Mark 4, 38, it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And while he slept as a man, he was watchful as God. Now, Brother Phil, would you read for us Psalms 121, verses 2 through 4, please? <clears throat> my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He is keeping me and will not slumber. Behold, he is keeping Israel, so neither slumber nor sleep. And so, you know, God never sleeps, He never slumbers, He's always aware of everything. And he's always ready to take care of his children. You know, back years ago, there was a, 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 a general in the English army by the name of Wellington. He had many victories. But when he got to be an old man, he retired from the military. And one day he was walking down the street. And he saw this little boy sitting along the, on the step. And he was just crying his eyes out. And Wellington asked this little boy, so why are you crying? He said, well... I got to go to school and and before he could finish saying what he was going to say Wellington began to rebuke him and he said son you ought to be ashamed of yourself you need to be a man and and go to school because that's how you learn and so when Wellington was, was through through rebuking the boy the boy said well sir he says I got a pet toad and when I go to school I ain't got nobody to take care of him and I don't know what's going to happen to my pet toad and Wellington apologized to the boy and he said, son, don't worry about your toad. I'll take care of your toad. You go on to school. Don't worry about it. When school's over, you come by my house and I'll give you back your toad. And so while the, the boy was in school, he received a letter from uh, retired General Wellington and it said, I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear you're in school and doing well. Don't worry about your toad. I'm taking good care of him. And when you get out of school, you come by and get your toad. Now, here was a man, a born-again man. He was born-again Christian. But he had concern for this little boy, and he was willing to take care of a, a toad. How much more is our God aware of our small needs? And he's always willing to take care of every little situation as well as the big situations. And so, you know, as we continue, we find the sleep of Jonah in the storm was not a peaceful sleep. Brother Russ, would you read for us Jonah chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, please? Thank you, Brother Russ. Now, notice it says he was a fast asleep until the shipmaster began to arouse him out of sleep and said, hey, pray to your God, we're about to perish. And so 
all the other crew members, they were harassing Jonah to get out of bed and, and get up there and start praying. And so, you know, Jonah did not have a restful sleep. And you know, a disobedient Christian will be a troubled sleeper. Unsaved people, they sleep well because they either are full of alcohol or full of drugs or they take sleeping pills to go to bed to go to sleep. That's the only way they can sleep. But you know, some Christians do that too. But uh, if a Christian is totally obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, he should have no problem sleeping. You know, when I lay down in my bed at night, I pray. Sometimes I fall asleep praying. And I've had somebody ask me one day, said, do you think it's a sin to fall asleep while you're praying? And my answer is this. I said, well, if you have a child, say your child is four or five years old and it's laying on your lap and it's talking to you and it falls asleep, do you get angry at that child? No. No, you just kiss them and pick them up and go put them to bed. God, our Father in Heaven, is a far greater parent than we'll ever even think to be. And you know, I don't think he is ever angry if we fall asleep while we're praying. I try to stay awake, but when I go to bed, I lay there, I pray, I, I turn over, and I'm out. I don't have anything to worry about because I've committed everything to him. And you know, that's what we need to do. Now, In Jonah's situation, he was the cause of the storm. But in Jesus' situation, he was the queller of the storm. Think about that. Now, the storms of life come to us under two different circumstances. First of all, because of our disobedience. Let's look over to the book of Hebrews. And it tells us something about this. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7 it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And so, because of our disobedience, God will bring some bad things into our life. He will allow bad things to come into our life. Now, the second reason for storms is to test our faith. And God does that sometimes. Sister Giles, would you read for us 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, please? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Thank you, sister. Now, the fiery trial, it tries us. And you know, sometimes God allows bad things to come to us just to see how we're going to respond. And he knows what we're going to do. But as we move on, we see the miracle proper. They awoke the Lord and he arose and rebuked the storm. Luke 8, 24 says, And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a great calm according to Matthew and Mark. Now Luke says it was a calm, but Matthew and Mark says it was a great calm. And the Lord's word always brings peace. You know, there's a book called The Peace Child. Have any, any of you ever read that book? The Peace Child. Have you read that, Monica? I think in the book, I think it tells about this missionary couple that went to a people called the Sawi, S-A-W-I, Sawi people. And they tried to do good things for those people. Those people looked at them with suspicion. They thought, well, what are they up to? Why are they doing this? And so anyway, as time went by, they, they learned that in that tribe, if a man had a son and he gave that son to the, to the chief of another tribe, that would bond their friendship for the rest of their life. And anyone that touched that child would make that person a friend of that father that gave that child. And so they used that story to present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God had given his only begotten son to redeem them from hell and to give them peace between themselves and God. And so, you know, 
The Lord's word always brings peace. And uh, Brother Giles, would you read for us Psalms 89 and verse 9, please? Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Thank you, Brother Giles. Now, this was not a little storm. Satan was out to destroy Jesus. He is, he is the, the prince and the power of the air, according to Ephesians 2, verse 2. And he's always tried to destroy Jesus. You know, when Mary was carrying Jesus in her womb, and uh, Caesar put out the decree that all the world should be taxed, Joseph and Mary had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a distance of about 70 miles, and she probably had to ride on a donkey. And I believe Satan, this was his plan to try to get her to miscarry baby Jesus. But it didn't happen. And when they got to Bethlehem, she gave birth to Jesus. Remember, the, the kings came, they followed his star, and they came to King Herod. And uh, they asked him where the Christ child was to be born. And he said, well, I don't know. He called the scribes and they said, well, according to uh, Micah 5, 2, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So he said, when you find him, you come and tell me so I can go worship him also. But he lied. And he just wanted to kill Jesus. And so anyway, an angel uh, warned the wise men not to, not to go uh, back to Herod, but to go back home a different way. And so anyway, when Herod found out that they had deceived him, uh, he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem. But the night before, an angel had warned Joseph to take Mary and the Christ child and flee into Egypt. And after they were gone, the soldiers came in and slaughtered all the little baby, uh, little boy babies from two years old and under. But uh, the devil has always tried to destroy Christ, and he tried to do it right here. In this story, in this in this miracle, and uh, and when Christ went to the cross and was nailed to the cross, I'm sure the devil was just laughing and just filled with glee. Man, he was so happy. But when Christ resurrected from the dead, this blew his mind. He didn't expect that. And you know, uh, Christ being God, there's no way that he could remain in the tomb. Uh, he is he is the very source of all life, and so. You know, uh, the question is, what does this miracle teach us besides what we see on the surface? First of all, let's consider the sea. This is a symbol of the restless, stormy, sinful world in which we live today. Now, Brother Dunn, would you read for us Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21? Thank you, Brother Dunn. There's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. They don't know what peace is. Ungodly people, unsaved people, they do not understand what peace, what real inward peace is. And you know, in Revelation 17, verse 15, it says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, by the way, the whore, I believe, is a symbol for the Roman Catholic system. It says... These are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Going back in world history, 4,000 years, out of those 4,000 years, only three, about 300 years of that was times of peace. The rest of those years were times of war somewhere in the world. And over 8,000 peace treaties were broken during those 4,000 years because men do not keep their word. Now, let's consider the wind. The wind is a symbol of the blast of persecution. During times when Christians are being persecuted, it seems the Lord is asleep and does not hear the cries of the persecuted, but that's not so. Remember the people of Israel when they were in bondage in Egypt? God remembered them and God brought them out by the hand of Moses by performing all the different miracles and all these bad things that happened to the nation of Egypt. And you know, today, 
And there are Christians in China and North Korea and in the Muslim nations, they're suffering persecution. And uh, I mean, they, uh, some of them even have to meet in automobiles to, to be safe. And they drive around and study their Bible. They just drive around. Somebody's in there reading the Bible. And the driver, he's driving, listening. And that's the way they, that's the way they have to worship God today. And so, you know, uh, persecution is in the world today, even though we, we don't, we're not, we're not experiencing it, but it's, it's in the world. Now, you know, because of this, because of this persecution, believers become faint hearted and afraid, just like the disciples did in that boat that night when Jesus quelled the wind and the, and, and the waves. And you know, wind symbolizes various things, and we must consider the context here. Uh, Sister Dunn, would you read for us Matthew 7, verse 25, please? And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind grew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Amen. The rock being Jesus Christ. And you know, when the storms of life come to us, because we're situated on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, the storms of this life can never bring us down. Oh, we might be tortured. We might even be put to death. But they can never take away our faith in our Savior. And, uh, you know, it's like a man that was washed off of a ship. And it was close to the shoreline. And the man, the, the waves washed this man up on this big rock. And he was able to cling to the rock all night long. He was on that rock and the waves were rolling over him. And anyway, the next day he was rescued and somebody asked him, said, what, wasn't, you, wasn't you scared you was going to lose your life? And he said, no, I was clinging to the rock. And you know, we, we don't have to cling to the rock, our Lord Jesus Christ. He clings to us. He hangs on to us. No matter what we do, he hangs on to us. He'll never let us go. And I thank God for that. But anyway, the boat, let's consider the boat. This is a symbol of the church. The wind and waves of this world rage against the Lord's church. But with all of its power, the world cannot, be, cannot overcome it because Christ is in it. Just like he was in the boat, he's in the church. And the true church of God can never be overcome by this ungodly world. Jesus said, I will, I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Sister Monica, would you read for us Psalms 46, 1 through 3, please? Thank you, sister. Now, in Psalms 93, verses 3 through 5, it says, The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Now, get this. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Now, those of us who are born again, we are the house. We're the house of God. Now, this building, this is just a meeting place. You know, through the years, I've heard people point at a church building and say, that church over there, that's not the church. It's just a building. It's the, it's the, it's the church building. It's not the church. The people are the church. That's what makes up the church. Now, we're in a great spiritual conflict. But we need to remember God's in control. Now the Democrats, they want to take our guns away. They want to murder the little unborn babies right up till the point of birth. And I believe if they get into power, the next step will be euthanization of the elderly. I believe they're going to want to 
eliminate all the old people out of the rest homes and out of society because we're not very productive anymore. And you know, I remember back years ago down in Florida, there was a vote on euthanasia of the elderly, the people that were confined to rest homes and hospitals and couldn't do anything for themselves. And it failed by one vote. And that's been over 20 years ago in the state of Florida because of the Democrats were in great power in Florida in those days. It, it might have been more than 20 years ago. But anyway, in John 14, verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. These are the words of our Savior. In Psalms 118, verses 8 and 9, he says, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And so, you know, we can't put our confidence in the politicians. We've got to put our confidence, our trust, in our Savior. He's the only one. He's the only one that can change things. He's the only one that can bring about a, a good election. And uh, whether he does or he doesn't, we need to consider it his will, however way it goes, and be willing to bear up under any persecution that comes our way and be true and faithful to God and to his word until the Lord takes us home. Amen? Anybody got a question? All you people never have questions. Yeah. Well, that's probably because I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed and we'll get ready for church. Father in heaven, we thank you again, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord, I pray, God, when we teach your word that we would make it plain God, that your children might understand it. And God, that we might have the grace for you to apply these truths to our lives. And Father, we pray, Lord, for this worship service this morning. We pray that we would honor you and, and thank you and praise you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. And God, we pray for new folks, godly folks, to be brought into this church and Lord, you said in your word, if any two shall agree as touching anything on the earth, it shall be done for them of your Father which is in heaven. Father, we believe that you're going to bless this church and all the other struggling churches, Lord. And God, give us souls, give us new families in our churches and help our churches to grow that we might bring honor and glory to you for all these things. We do pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Yes, he does. Every day he does. <clears throat>